Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandian. Why do we partake of communion in church? Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. There really is no power in the cup. There really is no power in the bread. The power is in remembrance of what Jesus did for you. Let's go to the Word of God together and rejoice in what Jesus Christ has done for us. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. We're teaching on fundamentals of the faith. And what I'm bringing this is, is fundamentals that should occur in church services. Why do we have church the way we do? Uh, we're gonna get into praise and worship here in, in uh, one of the other ones coming in. You know, why do we have praise and worship when we first start the church service? Why not have it later? And uh, why do we have the preaching of the Word of God? And today we're talking about the communion table. And in other ones, what I've talked about, such as when we have a person receive Jesus, I think that ought to be every service. To get people filled with the Holy Spirit, that was our second one that we talked about. That ought to happen in front of everybody. Part of the church service should be to uh, have people receive Jesus and have people be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this should come probably at the end of the service. Now that doesn't mean it has to. There's been times, there was one time I stopped in the middle of the service and said, you know what, there's somebody here who needs to be saved. And I invited anybody who wanted to get saved to come up. Then we finished the sermon after that. Man, that's wonderful. And uh, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I've taught them being filled with the Holy Spirit and just stopped in the middle and had everybody want to receive it, just lift up their hands and join everybody else as we all praise the Lord in other tongues, they can join in. So this is just some simplicity of how with that the service runs. But why do we have order? Why would you have certain things? And uh, people are often want to change it because they say, well, can we kind of get in a rut? Well, you can keep it from getting in a rut by emphasizing why we do it, the importance of why we do it. That's like, well, I get in a rut eating every day. Well, you know what? You can get in a rut, but you know what? Understand it's a necessity. On top of that, enjoy your meal. So enjoy the time when we see people saved. Enjoy the time when we see people filled with the Holy Spirit. And my main thing is, again, do it in front of everybody. Don't do it in some side room. Can you see Jesus out there preaching? He says, listen, for all you that want to receive me, we have a tent back here. Just go back here and we're going to lead you to the Lord back here. You want to get filled with the Holy Spirit? Come back here. You want to get healed? Oh, come back here to this tent and keep it away from everybody. Why? The Bible says when people were healed that they all rejoiced together and they gave God glory for what happened because they got to be witnesses of it. People ought to witness the fact that someone gives their life to Jesus or filled with the Holy Spirit or even laying hands on the sick. Today, we're going to talk about the communion table. What's important about the communion table? This is one that we don't have to have on a regular basis. The Bible just simply says, as often as you do it, it's up to you. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. There again, we're told when you do do it, do it in remembrance of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Don't let it get lost in the shuffle of things to where it's just time to dip that, you know, to take that uh, drink of communion wine or to take that cracker and eat it and not even know why we're doing it. There needs to be an explanation. And it's an outward visible thing we all do in front of each other. And I don't think that you have to take somebody off to the side and do it. No, in fact, do it in front of everybody. Have the congregation do it or all come to the front and receive or all come to the front and get your elements and we all receive together how important that really is. And Isaiah 53 verses four and five tell us about two works of Jesus on the cross. And uh, verse four says, as surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Verse five, he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him, the chastisement that brought us peace and with his stripes, we are healed. In verse four, we have two words there in the King James, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And really in other translations is brought out differently because the Hebrew word for griefs is the word koili. And it means sickness or disease. And the Hebrew word for sorrows is the word makab, which means physical pain. And then in verse five, we have our salvation. In verse four, we have divine healing because on the cross, Jesus took our sicknesses, our diseases, and our physical pains on the cross. Also, as he took our sins on the cross. And verse five says, the chastisement of our peace. 
Peace is the first thing we receive when we're born again. Uh, Romans chapter five and verse one, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But then also at the end of verse five, it says that by his stripes, we were healed. So the work of salvation came by the blood of Jesus Christ. And the work of healing came through the body of Jesus Christ by the stripes that he bore. In other words, we have two different aspects of the redemptive work of Jesus. And in communion, we have two redemptive acts seen in one element, which is the uh, cup that is the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleansed our sins. But on this side, we have the body of Jesus Christ seen in the bread that by his stripes we were healed. It's interesting to point out that in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says there that uh, many are sick among you. Why? Not discerning the Lord's body. Notice it doesn't say his whole work on the cross. No, not discerning the Lord's body. The reason why you're there are sick and people among you that are sick, it says they don't discern what happened in his body. It was by his stripes that we were healed. In Jesus' death on the cross, we have salvation for the inward man and healing for the outward man. Both were accomplished at the cross. Salvation and divine healing are inseparably linked. I think that's why it's important, again, that we do this in front of people to help understand what was it Jesus went to the cross for. He went to the cross for our inward man, for salvation, and for our outward man, for, for divine healing, then link these two inseparably together. Let me give you some other translations of, of Isaiah 53, verses four and five. Young's translation says this, he was a man of pains and acquainted with sickness. Surely our sicknesses he has borne and our pains he has carried. Very good, Isaac Leeser, a man of pains and acquainted with disease, but only our diseases did he bear and our pains he carried. Amplified, says a man of sorrows and pains, acquainted with griefs and sickness. So here we have it again in the Amplified, Rotherham, a man of pains and familiar with sickness, our sicknesses he carried, and as for our pains, he bore the burden of them. My favorite is the Bible in Living English by Stephen Byington, and here's what it says. He was despised and avoided by men, a man of pains and familiar with sickness. Like one from whom people screened their faces, we despised him and did not count him for anything. But in fact, it was our sicknesses he was carrying, our pains he was loaded with, while all the time we thought he was a smitten one, struck by God and disciplined, he was being stabbed by our crimes, felled by our guilt. The chastisement to give us soundness came on him and by his stripes, we got healing. Well, there's no way around that one. That so brings it out that Jesus on the cross took our sins, the most important thing. But next of all, our sicknesses. Why? Because one typifies the other. One is visible, one is not. Our sins are invisible. We cannot see them, but sickness can come to the outside. We can see the symptoms and all these things. And when a person is healed and we can actually see it, God is simply bringing to the outside what he did for us and shows us what he does on the inside by removing sin. If he can remove sickness, he simply said, that's the outward example of what I can do inwardly for you is remove your sin. Exodus chapter 12, after the Passover for sins and the people took it, it says there was not one feeble one among them. Whew, isn't that great? Not one feeble one among them. Second Chronicles chapter 30, and verse 20, it says, when the people took the Passover, the Lord listened to Hezekiah and healed the people. Healing came because of the Passover. The Passover representing Jesus Christ going to the cross for us where he took our sins and he took our sicknesses. Leviticus chapter 14 and verse 18, atonement was made for the cleansing of the leper. Leprosy was a type of sin. Why was sickness used for a sin? And why did the atonement for the leper having to offer a sacrifice of two, uh, two birds, why did that have to be done if it wasn't pointing back to the cross? It was through the cross that the leper is made uh, clean and leprosy is a type of sin throughout the word of God because why? Leprosy was the AIDS of its day. There was no cure for it. It was incurable, but Jesus came to, to heal incurable diseases and get rid of the worst of sins inside of us. Numbers chapter 21 and verse nine says this, a brass serpent was placed on a pole 
for the physical healing of snake bite. And Jesus used this as an example of salvation. John 3, 14 and 15, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Why? That was for physical bites from serpents. It says, so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The serpent's bite was sickness as well as sin. So when Jesus went and covered all that Satan had done, Satan is the one responsible for sin and Satan is the one responsible for sickness. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Psalm 103 verses one through three, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all of your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases. Notice that. Whoever comes, he heals them of all. When it comes to salvation, whoever comes, he forgives them of all because the same grace of God that forgives your sins, heals your diseases, this is what communion is. Communion is a constant reminder of where this all began. It didn't begin with me, it began with Jesus. Oh, the sickness and all the disease and all the curses, the door was opened up through Adam for Satan to come in. But oh, on the cross, Jesus Christ slammed the door in Satan's face and simply says, whosoever will may come. Whosoever will may come and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, have your sins forgiven, but also whosoever comes can have your diseases healed. And that's why communion is so necessary. Those two elements represent the two major things that Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Luke 4, 18, Jesus was anointed. He's, Jesus said, he's, the Holy Spirit has anointed me to preach the gospel, bring deliverance to the captive, that's sin, recovery of sight to the blind, that's sickness, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jubilee, he said, has arrived, and this is an eternal jubilee. You don't have to wait 49 years for the next one. No, it happens, and you can walk in a perpetual jubilee every day where everything goes back to its original owner. Sin and sickness goes back to Satan, and healing and salvation for sin comes to me, and God swaps those two. Everything goes back to its original owner. Satan was the original owner of sin, and Satan was the original owner of sickness and disease. I was the original owner in Adam when he was first created of righteousness and walking in health, but that has been restored back to me. Leviticus chapter 25. And verse nine says, Jubilee began the day after the atonement. <laughs> Isn't that great? It took the atonement for Jubilee to come. Jubilee restored everything back to its original owner, righteousness and health to the believer, and sin and sickness goes right back to Satan. Well, that's the beauty of it. I wanna to speak to you also who are watching that are my uh, partners. Those of you who would join me in this thing, we're not partners in crime. That's the first thing I thought about when I thought about partners. No, we are partners in righteousness. We are partners in anti-crime. We are partners in setting people free. And that comes through the salvation message of Jesus Christ and what I've just been teaching here, as well as the fact that he's also sent us to lay hands on the sick and see them recover and to make disciples of all nations. And that's what I'm doing. My main ministry is to raise up disciples. My main ministry is to help raise up a new generation of ministers, as well as disciples, to carry on this importance of walking out the word of God and teaching the word of God to people. It says in Isaiah 33, six, wisdom and knowledge, that is input and output, production of the word of God, will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. If there's anything the world needs is to see stable Christians and Christians who understand I have been saved and I am saved, I possess eternal life. That comes by wisdom and knowledge. That's what I'm called to. If you'd like to become a partner with me, go to my website, bobyandin.com. You'll find a place there where you can become a partner with me and join me. I'll see you right after the break. Healing might be one of the most controversial topics in Christendom. The Bible is very clear, but some teaching concerning divine healing have been confusing. The fact remains, God desires for us to be well. In this comprehensive series, Bob Yandian makes divine healing simple to understand and easy to receive. This USB flash drive on healing has over 15 hours of audio teaching and one ebook on the topic of healing. In it, Bob Yandian follows the truth of God's Word through many healing topics, including Jesus Stripes, the effect of strife, God's nature, forgiveness, Satan's devices, Paul's thorn, Ways and Methods of Healing, The Healing Lamb, and The Other Side of the Cross. To order your healing flash drive, visit our website at bobyendian.com. 
Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandian. Many years ago, I wrote the book called God's Word to Pastors, and now I have updated it. Many new things I have seen from the Word of God applied into this book, and you're gonna be greatly blessed by it. I'm called to be a pastor, I trust you are too, and you will wanna get this book and become greatly impressed by what Paul had to say to pastors in Acts chapter 20. But I break this book down into, first of all, theology parts about how to minister the Word of God, how to search out the Word of God, but also practical application in choosing leadership in your church, church board members, Members. A lot of other things are brought out in this book that I honestly think that's why I enjoyed this book so much and really, really wanted to update it. Many things I've applied in other books have all been condensed into one book. I think you're going to be greatly blessed by the new updated version of God's Word to Pastors. To order your copy, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. All right, let's return back to the Word of God. I want you to turn to James chapter five. We're gonna take a look at verse 16. And then we'll also go back and take a look at verse 15. And here we're talking about, again, the importance of communion, having communion in church, what communion stands for. Everything I'm teaching this week is why do we have this in church? People might say, well, I get tired of communion in church. Well, you don't understand what it's all about. It's a, listen, I think of thank God daily for the work of the cross. Well, then why can't I thank God weekly or monthly in church as we have communion to thank the Lord for what he did for us on the cross? Number one, for the, for the cup, that represents the shed blood of Jesus for salvation from sins, but the bread, speaking of his work in his flesh, in his body, that by his stripes we are healed. And the Lord that forgives all of our iniquities heals all of our diseases. How wonderful that is. And so this is, again, things we ought to see in church. We've talked about the very first day. We talked about leading people to Jesus in church. Although not everybody coming to church is, is, is a, a sinner. Most of them are Christians. We may have some services where nobody gets saved, but you know what? We give the invitation and keep on giving the invitation. If one person comes down, there's a party in heaven. There should be a party in church. All heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. We ought to do the same thing here on earth. But also we need to do it in front of people, not do it in some side room, but do it in front of people where people can see it. The same thing next of all comes with being filled with the Holy Spirit. We talked about that in yesterday's broadcast, how important that is. And today we're talking about communion. All this ought to be done publicly in front of Christians as a constant reminder of what it costs God and also the free gift that God has offered to us of eternal life and to walk with him daily in power, in resurrection power by the infilling of the Holy Spirit to set people free and also by the communion we're talking about today. James chapter five and verse 16 says this, confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. It goes on to say the prayer of faith will save the sick and if he's committed any sins, they will be forgiven him. Did you notice this? The prayer of faith will deliver the sick person, but also if he's committed any sins, it will be forgiven him. Notice the two go hand in hand, one with each other. Confess your faults, that gets you forgiven of sins, but then it goes on to say that you may be healed. So healing is included. In other words, laying hands on the sick and making sure before you do that if you've wronged a person, go to them and tell if they know about it. I'm not talking about you confess in front of everybody when they don't know anything about it. No, it's Bible says if you have ought against your brother, go to him. If he has ought against you, go to him. Okay, and this is what we should be doing. But if you have faults between each other, go and settle that. It goes on to say that you may be healed. You carrying that load of sin can block the healing power of God. So clear the path so that it can now work. And then it goes on to say, because the prayer of faith will, doesn't say might, it says the prayer of faith will save the sick. If he's committed any sins, they will be forgiven. Will is attached to sickness and will is attached to sin. He will heal, he will forgive. We often say, well, whosoever will can receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, but you know, we have to wait for God's will on healing the sick. No, 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 God's will is as much for healing of sickness as it is for forgiveness of sins. And he simply says, pray for them. They will be healed. The prayer of faith will save the sick. And then he goes on to say, and the prayer of faith will also see that sins are forgiven. So again, we have it there. Matthew chapter nine to me is one of the greatest verses of scripture because this man came and was in the temple 
And the, and the uh, religious leaders were looking to Jesus, waiting for him to try to heal this guy so they could ridicule him. But of course, Jesus just, you know, completely blew them away. And he come and he's about to uh, tell this man, and he told this man, he said, sir, he said, your sins are forgiven. Oh, they jumped on that one because they thought for sure he was going to heal the guy. But the first thing he said is your sins are forgiven. They thought, oh, this is even better. Only God can forgive sins. They didn't realize God was standing in front of them in the flesh. And then Jesus said to the men around him, he says, wait a minute, what are you talking about? He said, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or arise, take up your bed and walk. What's he saying? For me, one is as simple as the other. I atoned for both. I went to the cross for both. He says, I just said, your sins are forgiven. And now he says, and which is easier to say, rise and walk. In other words, with these men, they couldn't say either one. Oh, probably they may say, if you gave them enough money, oh, thank you, sir, your sins are forgiven. But it was not real. It didn't count because why? They couldn't forgive sins and money cannot buy the forgiveness of sins. So if they, if you gave money and they said, oh, thank you, your sins are forgiven, listen, you might as well throw it out. It's not worth anything. I didn't pay money to get my sins forgiven. If I did, it didn't work because faith is what is possible next of all, but they would never say rise and take up your bed and walk because they know it wouldn't work. They couldn't heal people. And what the Lord was simply saying to them, you can't forgive sins either. Only God can forgive sins and only God can say rise up and walk. Then he goes on to say in verse six, but you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I'm gonna show you, I am God in the flesh. I am the son of man, the son of God become the son of man. And I'm gonna show you that God has given to me as a man, as a human being walking with him, he's given me authority on earth to forgive sins because that's the greatest. He said, I'm going to prove to you I can forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And the man did that. Jesus simply said, healing is the outward demonstration of what I can do in the heart. Healing is the manifestation in front of people that I can forgive sins. And he said, now go pick up your bed and walk. And that's why he forgives all of our iniquities, heals all of our diseases. The two are inseparably tied together. That's why communion has two elements. And here's one thing I think is important. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Well, of course I have. Sure, then you've partaken of the cup. Have you received Jesus Christ as your personal healer? Uh, no. Well, then you can. Why not, if the cup represents the fact he is your permanent savior, why don't you now receive him as your permanent healer? You know what? I don't sin as a sinner. I sin as a Christian. There's a difference between the two. And that cup, not only I see it as, as I became a Christian, but also if there's any sin in my life, I can ask the Lord to forgive it. And he will because that cup represents not only the fact I can be saved, I can walk in that in daily life and any sins I've committed can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Salvation was the shedding of blood, but in my daily walk, there's the sprinkling of blood. First John 1, 9, if I confess that sin, he's faithful and just to forgive it. But here's the other side of it. There's a, also a piece of bread on this side. And just as I did with this one, I can do with this one. Once I receive Jesus Christ as my personal healer and permanent healer, I'm no longer a sick person trying to get healed. I am a healed person resisting the temptations and the symptoms to walk in sickness, and I refuse to do it. So that's the whole point. As a Christian, I have the power to resist sins. As a, as a healed person, receiving as my personal savior, I can now resist the symptoms to take on sickness and I can walk free from that. So Jesus said healing was the outward proof. He could forgive sins on the outside. Religion can do neither. The word sozo is interesting. The word sozo means salvation, but it also means healing. And it also means wholeness. There's so many different ways that sozo can be translated and applications like crazy. And so again, we're told that here in this by the word sozo. Jesus said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. It was the word sozo. Sozo is also the word used for healing and also the word for salvation. Jehovah is the Old Testament redemptive title for the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is his name in the New Testament. Jehovah was his name in the Old Testament. And all of the redemptive titles given to Jesus are attached to the word Jehovah. He's Jehovah Sid Kenyu. That's our righteousness. He's Jehovah Shalom. He's the Lord, our peace. He's Jehovah Shama. The Lord is present. He is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. But he's also Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord who heals you. 
You know, the best commentary of Isaiah 53, verses three and four, I read different translations. Let's read you the ultimate one. What did Jesus say about Isaiah 53, verses three and four? Matthew eight, verses 16 and 17 qualifies Isaiah 53, verses three and four. That evening, the multitudes brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirit with his word and then healed all who were sick that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our sicknesses and bore our diseases. You can't get any plainer than that. He not only took my sin on the cross by his blood, but in his body, he bore my sicknesses and he bore my diseases. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29 and 30 tells us why we have two elements of communion. Wine, speaking of the inward man, wine speaking for the blood of Jesus Christ, and then bread speaking for sickness outward. The wine again speaks of the blood of Jesus Christ and the bread speaks about his body. And his body was bruised and broken and uh, beaten for us. That was for our sickness and disease. But the wine was the for, for the sin, for the inward man. For this cause, I said, I quoted this before. Here it's quoted in verse 29 and 30, for this cause. Many are weak and sickly among you. What cause? He says, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, not discerning the Lord's body, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep or die early. In Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20 says this, he took bread. So when he partook of it with his disciples, and when he had given thanks, he broke and said to them, saying, this is my body, notice this, which is given for you this do in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup after he'd eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The blood brings us into the new covenant, but the bread can bring us into a provision of the new covenant, and that is divine healing for everyone of every sickness and every disease. What am I simply coming back to again? It's important in church that we have communion. So next time you see communion, if the pastor doesn't explain it well enough, just remember what I've just now talked about. Wow, I'm about to partake of a cup. Thank you, Jesus, for taking away all my sins and making me the righteousness of God in him. Then when you pick up that piece of bread, look at that and go, wow, the body of Jesus Christ healed me from every sickness and disease. The moment I eat of this cracker, the moment I eat of this tiny piece of bread, Cancer that's in me, that's been diagnosed by the doctor, I simply here to tell you, you are now meeting the power of God that took away cancer, took all my diseases, all my sicknesses. He forgave all of my iniquities. That's the cup, but he heals all of my diseases. I'm gonna receive that right now. And when you take it, thank God, that disease in you, that cancer in you is cursed by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of the healing power of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you need healing today? Then let's just right now partake of communion spiritually. I don't have any elements in front of me, but I want you to understand something. If you've been born again, you have drank of the cup. Why not eat of the bread right now? Father, I pray for these people watching. In the name of Jesus, disease and sickness, I curse you. Rebuke you from the life of this believer. You're a trespasser onto God's private property and we command you to turn loose. And Father, we receive right now, by the name of Jesus, your healing, anointing, and power flowing into these people. And we do it and receive it in the name of Jesus. You know what you need to do? If that was you that just got healed, I mean, you you felt it, it was manifest. Would you send me an email? Go to my website, there's a place you can send an email and let me know that through this simple prayer, you received healing for your sickness and disease. You actually partook of the bread that was offered the broken body of Jesus Christ. See you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Visit bobyandian.com. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.